All perfect praises to Allah, the Father of the universe, the author, creator, governor of the world, the almighty and eternal and incomprehensible. All praises are truly due to Allah. We extend the highest honors to his holy and divine prophet, Prophet Noble Drali, the founder of the Moorish Science Temple of America. A redeemer and savior of humanity. Islam? Islam. Well. How's everyone on the holy night? All is well. All is truly well. Praise Allah. Um, I'd like to open by way of drawing from the Holy Quran and the more science summit of America. I'm inspired to draw from chapter 47. Chapter 47 is entitled Egypt, the capital empire of the dominion of Africa. Islam? Islam. The word, what does the word dominion mean? Anyone? Meaning in the uh, Lord is here. You said it. <laughs> Islam, uh, arise, giving the most high praise to the mighty God Allah and the highest of honor to his noble and divine prophet, Jerusalem. Islam, what? I mean, um, Islam, uh, I would say dominion is like absolute rulership. Demonstrate. You hit the key word. It's absolute control. Okay, we're familiar with this word here in modern English. Condominium, correct? Well, condominium is a corruption of common. Dominion. Where dominion comes from a dominus, which literally means lord or master. Islam? Islam. So now, when we're talking about Egypt, the capital empire of the dominion of Africa, the key, you know, clearly we're demonstrating the fact that the ancient Egyptians had an empire. Now, what is an empire? The empire is a conglomeration of nations, right? Right now, the United States is an empire, though it's a republic, right? If you look at how ancient uh, empires were run, ancient empires were run by various different nations being subordinate under one particular sovereign authority. Islam, right now all over the world, the United States has military bases all over the world. Islam, huh? has military bases all over the world. Wherever the U.S. flag flies, just being honest to this, not the flag of our birth, um, wherever this flag flies, you are on U.S. territory, right? You go on, if you leave from out of here, go into a post office right now. The jurisdiction just shifted from city of Atlanta to federal territory. Right? You know, you're under federal jurisdiction when you're in a post office because that's, you know, that's under that particular authority, right? That's federal area. Say again, it's federal, it's literally federal territory. All right, so ancient Egypt back in those days, you know, they had, you know, they were, they were the one, they were the shot callers. And it sets up various different, you know, conglomerations of nations answering to Egypt, right? Which in those days we would call Misr, M-I-S-R, or Mizraim. That's found in Genesis chapter 10. All right? Starting at verse 1, it says, The inhabitants of Africa are the descendants of the ancient Canaanites from the land of Canaan. Can anybody point me on the map? Where is the land of Canaan? Anyone? Call it. What present day country would people say is in the Israel. Israel, right? Israel. So most would say that the land of Canaan. Right here, right. But then, when you research ancient texts, and then when you research truths that have been buried, you know, under a, a science called Masonic, right? When you get to talking about the land of Canaan. You're talking about this. Right? Talking about the land of Canaan. You be talking about this. And the big Masonic secret is the land of Canada. That's this. Okay? The land of milk and honey, they say, right? The land of abundance, right? Let me just give this one away here, right? How many people heard of Hannibal? Hannibal. Right? Hannibal was from what city? Anybody remember? Remember the term Carthage before? Carthage. Carthage. Carthage was a city state. Right, because back in those days, how the ancient Canaanites ran their empire, they ran their empire by what are known as city states. Right? Mm 
right? City states were independent authorities that governed their affairs as though, we, uh, as though they were a nation, right? But they worked in conglomeration with a broader authority, okay? So the Barker family, which his name was Hannibal Barker, right? The Barker family was a family of military merchants, okay? Because Carthage was a, uh, was a commercial enterprise, was a commercial area, all right? And uh, the Barker family was hired um, from generations, like, you know, at least later, two generations before Hannibal to protect the, the commercial wealth of Carthage from the Romans, okay? Because again, if you look, where is Rome in relation to Carthage? This is Carthage right here. This is Rome right here. It's a canoe ride, okay? And Hannibal's father made him swear blood oath when he was eight, and the blood oath was something like, I swear for as long as I live, that I will forever be an enemy to Rome. Okay? So that was what he was on since he was a child, all right? But anyway, let's move forward. Verse 2. Old man Cush and his family are the first inhabitants of Africa who came from the land of Canaan. So, you know, historically when we do our research, you know, we hear about the Cushites. Okay? But the prophet didn't say that. The prophet said, old man Cush. I'm on verse 2 of chapter 47. Verse 2, chapter 47. Yes, that's not right. Old man Cush and his family were, uh, and his family are the first inhabitants of Africa who came from the land of Canaan. All right? So old man Cush, the Cushites, you have the Cushites and then you have the ancient Cushites. Right? Or the, so he says, old man Cush. Right? The original progenitors, right? Of that name called Cush. Because we know Cush is also a nation state as well. Right? So a lot of times we, we mix up when we hear in biblical record or ancient times, when they mention a particular, you know, um, name, we only put that as an individual, right? But, you know, in, in our one-on-one, Prophet Noah rather gives us a key, says, who were Adam and Eve? If I remember, who were Adam and Eve? And the answer is, they were the mothers and fathers of the human, of the human family, right? But it's, he, he mentions, the question says, who are Adam and Eve? That's two singular individuals. Same in English, right? Mm -hmm. But the answer says they are the mothers and fathers of the human family. Mm -hmm. Islam? So when you're talking about Adam, it talks about Adam lived 969 years, or whatever, or whatever, or however many years he lived. You know, this is as long as that particular dynastic family was about. Islam? All right? Says his father, Ham, and his family were second. Then came the word Ethiopia, which means the demarcation line of the dominion of a Mexico. The first true and divine name of Africa, the dividing of land between the father and the son. On old maps, they might know what the what, well, some of the earlier, one of the earliest names of this Atlantic Ocean was. Right know? Ethiopian Ocean. Demarcation line divided between father and son. Islam? All right. Take notes. I'm going to tell you some stuff you ain't heard before now. I'm not a preacher. I don't want you to believe nothing I'm saying. All right? Moving forward. The dominion of Cush. I'm talking about absolute control, right? The dominion of Cush. Northeast and Southeast Africa. And Northwest and Southwest was his father's dominion of Africa. In latter years, many of their brethren from Asia and the Holy Lands joined them. All right? So there were other different families, clans, and tribes that lived dispersed throughout. But because they had this commercial empire going and trading back and forth, other ones wanted to get on. All right? How many people just, I mean, just on a, on a mundane level, you know, since that's what we live daily, um, you know, you might be working a good job, right? And then somebody come across, you know, that you notice how they got to work. And they say, yo, man, where you working? You're looking good, man. Well, you know, I'm working at so and so. And you think you could put me on? Heard that before? It was the same thing in the ancient world. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody wanted to be on with the Moors, the ancient Moorish Empire, or the ancient Canaanite Empire, right? Because that was where the commerce and trade was going. Um, all throughout Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, why was it that the various nations in Sub-Saharan Africa became Muslim? Was it solely because of the faith of Muhammad, right? Or was it because of the commercial interests, right? Because again, I know I'm using the map a lot, right? Anybody heard of the Trans-Saharan um, trade route? Where was it? Which direction did it travel? Clearly it's in Africa. West. Which direction did we travel? West. East, west pattern, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And we'll come up and link up with the Silk Road coming through here and go all the way to China. 
So the Muslims, you know, in latter times, you know, the Muslims, as we know Islam today, set up this trading route going back and forth, right? And there was the Silk Road route going here. So whoever was demonstrating with the Moors, or the Muslim, the Muslims, or the ancient Canaanites had access to that route. If you didn't have, if you were a part of that, you know, that consortium, if we can say, if you didn't have access to all of that. So in other words, things we take for granted today, i.e., salt. What was the major? Who was the major producer of salt in the ancient world? China. Mm -hmm. Come on. South Africa. Yeah. West Africa. West Africa. Mali. 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 What does the word Mali mean? Right, you should know this one. Bank. Ali means bank. Where was the home of the, the most wealthiest person in history? Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa. It's no strange happening that his land, his nation state, was called bank. The bank, right? Well, his brother Islam. His brother so, is. His half brother was the ruler. Abu Bakr. Yeah. Right. But he, he left and came over to charted areas that, that they already knew about. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because it was known that if you place there, it's various different currents. And if you take you place a boat without a sail yeah. on that current, it'll bring you directly over here. Yeah. They knew that from times before them. Mm -hmm. Right? Because we saw my Mount Musa and Abu Bakr and all them. You saw it in the 1300s. That's yesterday to us. Right? So when they, you know, they, they, they knew that because of maps that were handed down to them for all the way back Hannibal's time and back before that, yeah. right? Like we talk about uh, General Tariq, right? 7-11 AD, when the Moors invaded and conquered Spain, come up from here. How did they know how to, you know, run through, because you remember, okay, let's do a timeline really quick. I know I'm back, but I'm come back, right? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born 570 AD. Okay. He gets his first revelation, 610 AD. Okay. Because of persecution and so on and so forth from his relatives in Mecca, he has to make what they call a hijra, which is like a, um, you know, which basically you're moving because of persecution. Basically. Right? They translate it as flight, but it's a bad translation. But, 622 A.D. Hijra. Okay. Uh, 622 A.D. is also, if you want to uh, know how to calculate the Islamic calendar, if you look at the Islamic calendar, you see it's like the year 1400 something, right? You have to calculate from 622 A.D. to now. That's what gives you the current date in the Islamic calendar. Okay? So, 622, 632. Uh, AD, Prophet Muhammad passes for him. Some would say died. A lot of people don't know the Prophet Muhammad was poisoned. Okay, it's a slow death that he died from. Alright? Then, and so now, he passed for him in 632. Okay? Islam left Arabia as we know it to, you know, as we know, aware of Islam today. That's a very narrow perception because I could bring you know, all the, the teachings of the Israelite patriarchs into that, what we're calling Islam, if I wanted to. Because they, like we talked about earlier, that way of life had no name. Mm. It was just something that we did, you see what I'm saying? Um, but that way of life, as we're aware of today, left Arabia, swept across northern Africa, and by 711 AD, these Muslims invaded Spain. So what we're looking at. So we're talking about 79 years. It took 79 years after the prophet, prophet Muhammad passed for our brothers to leave on, on foot, on camel, and on horseback to come across northern Africa, propagating the faith, right? Fighting wars with the Romans who were all in northern Africa, right? Push them out. Come into Spain, make a deal with the Berbers who were already there. Right? Get them to agree that we need to go ahead and do this and take it across here. 
and come up into Spain. Only 79 years. 79 on. Oh, right now we got cars, internet, so on and so forth. Why are we not moving like that? Do you understand what it takes to see when, when when that was sweeping through, it was the Romans that were terrified. They were like, what is this new thing that is uniting all these Asiatic tribes together? Islam? All right. Let's move forward. It says verse 6. The Moabites from the land of Moab who received permission from the pharaohs of Egypt to settle and inhabit northwest Africa. They were the founders and are the true possessors of the present Moroccan Empire. With their Canaanite, Hittite, and Amorite brethren who sojourned from the land of Canaan seeking new homes. Now for those taking notes, the terms, write down the terms, um, Possess, settle, inhabit, and sojourn. Because the prophet Noble Drowley was a he was a lawman. So he's not just talking to you, he's communicating legal principles. Alright? Legal principles that we know today that we call uh, pardon the idolatry, white man's law, right? It's actually ancient law that he co-opted once you got overthrown out of power, right? So if you picked up a legal dictionary, Black's Law Dictionary, that Moors love so much, you know, it's like a third Quran, right? <laughs> you pick up a Black's Law Dictionary, look up each one of those words, and you'll find a full demonstration that it, that it really plumbed the line to give you a broader perception of what the prophet is saying in verse 6. Islam, all right? Verse 7. It says their dominion and inhabitation extended from northeast and southwest Africa across the great Atlantis even unto the present north, south, and central America and also Mexico and the Atlantis Islands before the great earthquake which caused the great Atlantic Ocean. So now, here's the thing that, you know, we as Moorish Americans labor to try to get ones to realize about Prophet Noble Jerali, right? We love ancient history. Right? But there's not too much that we have in our hands now that connects us directly to the land that we're in. Right? So we can read all that, like ancient Egypt, you know, India, China, all that, you know, you can read all that, right? But how do you connect all of that to what's going on right now under your feet? And the text that you're holding in your hands, the Holy Quran, the more science of America, was the first text brought by an Asiatic, one of your own, to link your your existence right here in the Americas. And not make you a foreigner that you was dragging a boat here, right? But that if you do some digging, you know what I'm saying, and look through some, some jungles, whatever, you might find your forefather. You will find it. Islam? Mm -hmm. Verse 8. The river Nile was dredged and made by the ancient pharaohs of Egypt in order to trade with the surrounding kingdoms. Also, the Niger River was dredged by the great pharaoh of Egypt in those ancient days for trade. And it extends eastward from the river Nile westward across the Great Atlantic. It was used for trade and transportation. So your forefathers were such, they was dredging, you know, rivers. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like European creating, you know, is creating or making uh, like the, the Suez Canal and the Panama Canals. And, you know, and they're, they're doing that for commerce and trade. Same thing your forefathers are doing. They're, they're learning these principles by looking at things that your forefathers have already done. Islam? Islam. Right? Uh, verse 9. According to all true and divine records of the human race. There is no Negro, black, or colored race attached to the human family because all the inhabitants of Africa were and are of the human race, descendants of the ancient Canaanite nation from the holy land of Canaan. What your ancient forefathers were, you are today without doubt or contradiction. Let me go back to that, you know, that ancient land of Canaan and that land of Canaan piece, right? The prophet mentions the Moabites from the land of Moab, right? He mentions the, you know, the, the Hittites, the Amorites, so on and so forth, wherever seeking new homes, right? Um, historically, you know, we can look at Israel, so on and so forth. Um, we're clear that, you know, when under Joshua, when the Israelites came and took Canaan, or that portion of Canaan that we delineated earlier, right? That there was a there was a government already in place. There was a city already in place. There were priesthoods already in place, right? Now, in the ancient world, you know, depending on who you're talking about, but for the most part, if something was already established, 
it would be foolish to, to, to destroy it completely. A lot of times what you do is you absorb it and just change the heads up, right? Like the, one of, you know, like the holy city that's in, you know, uh, you know, that land is Jerusalem, right? You had them shot at, right? But that Jerusalem, that city of peace, was already a city named such in Canaan before Joshua got there, right? Melchizedek, Malachi son, the Canaanite priest king, right? Who Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils to, right? Was the one that taught Abraham the concept of the most high. Right? But again, if we're looking at it from dogmatic eyes and perspectives, we won't see that. Islam? All right. If there are any questions at, you know, at any point, you can feel free to ask. The sister said the last time I was saying I didn't open the floor for questions. <laughs> so she cornered me over here and had me with like three, four questions. But at any point, if anybody has anyone has any questions, please feel free. Right? But these things were already in place. So when Joshua and them came in, who Joshua was already anointed as a Messiah, right? Moshe anointed his head and gave him the degrees, you know what I'm saying, of, of Messiahship. Um, he came in, you know, and co-opted the, the priesthood of Malchus You know what I'm saying, what, what they call the Zadah, the Zadah or the Zadah priesthood. Islam? All right. Um, and again, this is us on us. These are not like no... In the ancient world, we would look, we might have looked at each other as foreigners, right? But, but from the perspective that we have now, no, we were all brothers and sisters. You see what I'm saying? Those are all olive tone, woolly we'll, we'll to wavy hair people. Islam, this is not the this is not the European at this point. Islam, right? Let's move forward. Again, what your ancient forefathers were, you are today, without doubt or contradiction. There is no one who is able to change man from the descendant nature of his forefathers unless his power extends beyond the great and universal Creator Allah Himself. These holy and divine laws are from the Prophet Noble Drawali, the founder of the uniting of the Moorish Science Temple of America. Um, anybody familiar with the, uh, the Egyptian temples? And uh, what was the writing that was over each one of them? <laughs> anybody know? It was even in the, the Greek temples, because they were students, right? What was over every the doorway of every... No, that's uh, okay. Moorish describes the man or woman, right? Science means to seek or to know. Islam, and your temple is thyself, or thyself is the temple. So when you're saying more science temple of America, you're saying, man, you know thyself. So it says the prophet is the founder of the uniting of the more science temple of America. He's the founder of the uniting of all these ancient sciences to give us back our birthright. Islam? Islam. Noble Jirali was one that spoke according to science, right? So you have to read his complete body of work to know what he's saying. You can't like, you know, Christianity gave us a bad habit. Respect to Christianity. You know, as much as respect I can get. But it gave us a bad habit. That bad habit was what I like to refer to as plucking verses. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who shall ever shall believe in him, shall not perish but have everlasting life. But then you skip past the part when he said, the works that I do, you'll do even greater. So if I got to get hung up on this cross, what's got to happen? You see what I'm saying? The point is, we like to pluck verses. So we'll take a particular thing. You know, like, like people think that the Moorish America is a pacifist because we have a teaching that says learn to love instead of hate, right? But it says, but he also says we are for love, truth, peace, freedom, justice. and when these principles are violated, justice must then take its course. So again, so you have to read the whole body of work and line upon line, precept upon precept, you build the whole concept of what, what you present to you, right? And you can only get that if you attend the meetings, you know, if you come and you know, ask once who've been on the road a little longer what certain principles mean, because you can't, you're not just going to pick it up and understand it yourself, right? That's just like if you um, attempted to learn a quote-unquote foreign language by yourself without someone teaching you the pronunciations, right? Your pronunciation would be, to a native speaker, you're going to sound funny, right? Because you were never taught how to properly enunciate those particular words. Islam? Islam. Moving forward, it says, 13, these laws are to be strictly preserved 
by the members of all the temples of the Morris Science Temple of America, that they would learn to open their meeting and guide it according to the principles of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Every subordinate temple of the Grand Major Temple is to form under the covenant of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice, and create their own laws and customs in conjunction with the laws of the Holy Prophet and the Grand Temple. I, the Prophet Noble Drali, was sent by the great God Allah to warn all Asiatics of America to repent from their sinful ways before the great and lawful day which is sure to come. He didn't say he was just coming to warn the Moorish Americans. He came to warn all Asiatics. I don't care what camp you're from. This warning applies to you if you're here in America. Islam 15, it says, the time has come when every nation must worship under its own vine and fig tree and every tongue must confess its own. Through sin and disobedience, every nation has suffered slavery due to the fact that they honor not the creed and principles of their forefathers. What is sin according to Islamism? What is sin according to the more science of Anything that alludes to slavery. Exactly. Principles that delude to slavery. So we're not talking about the Christian connotation of the word sin. Islam, we're talking about if you demonstrate principles that delude to slavery. Uh, I'll give you an example. Last night, um, I attended an event over at the Prince Hall Grand Lodge in College Park. And it was, uh, it was supposed to be a kind of like a seminar or a symposium for domestic violence, you know. And the reason why I wanted to go is because I do a lot of counseling work. So I want to see if I could pick, pick up some pointers here and there so I could as assist people in uplifting for humanity. But when I got there, um, it ended up being a situation where they were doing like some type of play. Right, about the rest of the politics, right? But before that, they had several speakers and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, everybody was talking about giving their, it was very Christian based, very, very Christian based. They were giving their testimonials about what they've been through, what they conquered, you know what I'm saying, by way of, you know, Christianity, whatever. And, um, but see, the problem with divine creed um, is that if you pick up, if you're using a divine creed, but you don't have a nationality, um, or you don't honor your national descent or the ways of your forefathers, you're going to demonstrate that particular divine creed or religion, you know, the way it was given to people to control. So in other words, these ones were in here, and when I tell you, you know, the cussing, the, like the, just the savage, like Negro behavior. So my sister, she was a comedian, and she was like, she was, you know, very, very tired of, you know, the young brothers, you know, walking around with their pants sagging and stuff like that. You know, this, this Asiatic pulled her pants down and had her whole behind out. Just, to, just to make the, you know, just to get the laugh. You know what I'm saying? You know, and it was just, you know, it kind of, it kind of saddened me to a degree because, you know, I've always known that, you know, that Christianity has not done anything for our people, you know, but to continue to enslave them. And I say this again, you know, with as much respect as I can garner, um, because Prophet told us not to speak radically agitating against the church, right? But you know, because a lot of, and the reason for that is because a lot of our people are still there, you know. But the thing that I realized, you know, the Prophet taught us this. He gave us this instruction. It tells us about belief, faith, and fruition, right? Some of the three steps out of it, right? What is belief according to the, the prophet of Man thinks it's true. That which man thinks might be true, thinks perhaps might be true, right? Faith is that which man knows is true, right? And fruition is when man himself becomes the truth. Or basically, when you become the message that you bring, that's when you reach fruition. And this level right here, he refers to this as deific life. Right? In Greek, that's called apotheosis. Anybody remember what that means? To become God, we covered that before in the U.S. Yeah. Capitol building in the Rotunda. If you look up inside the dome, there's a mural called the Apotheosis of George Washington, and that makes basically saying George Washington becoming God. Okay, they demonstrate in degrees, but we don't study them, so they rule over us, right? Um, deific life, or you know. Psalms 82.6, ye are all gods and children of the most high. 
You know what I'm saying? So again, like I'm saying, like Prophet Noble Israel, he didn't bring us anything new per se, right? He just brought us the teachings of our forefathers. Because as you as the European nations enslaved our forefathers, they couldn't have gave us this this degree of study, right? Where you become God over your own self. You're not the most high, you're not Allah. No. The father of the universe anyway, but the nearest place to meet Allah. It's in the heart. It's you know, Prophet Muhammad, you know, in, in his you know, teaching said that Allah is closer to you than your own judgment of That's how? So that, that divinity being internal, it wouldn't be within the European nation's best interest to teach you that. Because they have to give you a crutch or something to lean on. And that thing has to be based on their image. Islam? Mm -hmm. So, and they definitely couldn't teach you faith, right? Because even in the, you know, the biblical perspective, you know, it talks about, you know, it gives a definition of it where it talks about substance and evidence. <laughs> right? So it's kind of a blind faith. I don't know who taught us that. Because it doesn't say it in the record. You know? And again, you know, our people, you know, especially when, when we become Afrocentric, you know, we love our Afrocentricism, right? Well, why, you know, we, we, you know, we think this one's deep right here. I hear this a lot. Why would, the, why would the oppressor give you a book, you know, that was going to free you, or that was going to free you, or, you know, empower you? So the Bible, he gave you the Bible to enslave you. Have you ever read the Bible? <laughs> because if you've read it, there's enough in there to free you. Mm -hmm. Right? But and you got to know what you're looking at. Right? You can't go on what, you know, you can go on what man, what other men say, but you'll never know. Right? For you to you know for you to truly know, you must be what you know. Right? So they did was they trapped us in this section here. Right? We're trapped in that which man thinks perhaps might be true. Okay? And when you hear our brothers and sisters, right, and talking about how much they love Jesus and what Jesus did for them, and my Lord and Savior, and so on and so forth, right? It's because they they don't know themselves. Right? Because if they knew themselves, they would know the same foes that, that according to that story that person had to fight, they have to fight and conquer. Islam? Islam. Right? So that's the thing I just want to hit on that. And the last point, and this last instruction for verse, verse 17, it says, that's why, excuse me, that is why the nationality of the Moors was taken away from them in 1774, and the word Negro, Black, and Colored was given to the Asiatics of America who were of Moorish descent, because they honored not the principle of their mother and father, and strayed after the gods of Europe, of whom they knew nothing of. Islam, Moors? Mm -hmm. Surely Allah speaks the truth to his holy divine prophet, Lord Jew Ali Islam. So, the prophet gives you the why these, these particular brands were placed upon us, okay? So, and again, he tells us that it's through sin and disobedience, right? Even if, if you look at the biblical record, the Quranic record, whatever record you want to look, true and divine records on the earth, right, you'll see that when men fell away from the way of their forefathers in the golden era, they became enslaved by another group of people, right? Worst of it happened to us, clearly, right? So who, who did we have to be, right? And what must we have done to incur that? We don't like to deal with that. You know what I'm saying? Because we like, you know, the victim thing. We like to point out, he, we was in this they came and dragged us from Africa. And so what was you doing in Africa? Mm -hmm. What were you doing in Spain? What were you doing everywhere where you at? I'm talking, I'm not talking about the whole time. I'm talking about the end of the empire. You know, and I've read some records, there's some things I, I often debated. Doggone, do I tell the Moors that their forefathers did this? There's some stuff that you, you know, like, you gotta be very careful when you invoke the concept of you know, honoring your forefathers because not all your forefathers was honorable. Islam, you know, we all have people in our immediate family that ain't worth nothing. Immediate. So you know in ancient times, you know, and you put like, you know, you the, you the master of all you survey, you know, everybody's bowing down to you. Europeans have to step off the sidewalk when you walked up. You know what I mean? They brushed up against you, the whole community come out and beat them. That was during those days, okay? So what, what did we do to humanity? You know, the, the concept of making slavery a business, who introduced that to the world? Let, let's look at it this way. <laughs> Who's the oldest people on the planet? Yeah. Right? So if you're the oldest people on the planet, yeah, all the good, you were the first one to do that too. But how about the negativity? Were you the first one to do that as well? Right, but see again, until we're able to own up to that, 
See, the, the world knows that history. You know, we talk about the Moors, or when we talk about how innocent we are, how unjust we're being treated, they look at us like, who, who are y'all for? We know who y'all all are what y'all look like. You know what I'm saying? But see, the thing is, you know, the, the karma for that is burnt out. We know that to be true because our nationality and divine creed was returned to us. Right? Until that time, all we ever thought we were was Negroes. Right? I have elders right now that I know. They got, I got to fight with them tooth and nail to not use the word Negro. You know, you know us Negroes ain't going to do such and such. That, that mentality is still on them. Right? And if you think the mentality is still not alive, ask our people what they think they are. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a black man. Brother, you know that black and Negro is the same word. So you're basically saying you're a Negro. I ain't no Negro. Yes, you, but you're clearly saying that you are. And when you tell the world that you're a black man or woman, this is what you're telling them that you are. And as a result of that, there are laws, statutes, ordinances, so on and so forth, to govern Negroes, blacks, and colors, and African Americans. Whatever new name you want to make up that's based on a color or a basic concept of continents. You want to be two continents. It's going to be Africa and America. Islam? Mm -hmm. All right? Let me draw from something else. Because I want to address the state. Okay? Can I ask you a question? By all means, sister. You're saying. Um, Please speak up so, so the camera can get. You were saying, how can you be from two continents? Yes. But you just were showing how the wars have dominion over all of these. Yeah, we have dominion. But see, here's the thing. Each one of these, each, each one of these, throughout that empire, each one of these places, I'm, you know, I'm circling throughout, all had they were all individual nations. Okay, now more here's, here's the trick about the word more. Okay, or Moorish. Okay, Moorish can be either Moorish can be either a National identifier or an empirical what do I mean? Because Morocco is a nation. True? But Morocco had military and commercial influence in all these different areas here, right? Specifically Northern Africa, I'm talking I'm back, coming back to the time, let's say post 711 AD, okay? So 711 AD, let's say to 1492. Let's, let's do that, it's convenient, all right? So this area was what's known as the Barbary States. Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. The Barbary States, right? You had the Sultan of Morocco, right? And then in each of the other areas, you had a regional bay, B -E -Y. And the, the word bay means government. An example, how you know Moors had influence even here in the United States of America, because you have 50 states, right? And you have a federal government. Who's over the federal government? Who's over, what's the highest office in the land? President. President, right? And, but each, and you know, that's the state that's under the federal constitution, right? But each state also has its own constitution, correct? Georgia has its constitution, right? So who's the highest, what's the highest office in the state? Governor, which is the word bay, it's the same. Okay? So the bay, the bay of Algeria, the bay of Libya, the bay of Tunisia, all answer to the Sultan of Morocco. My prophet of Jerusalem gives you the teaching, says, What is the title given to our ruler in Morocco? Sultan. Okay? Sultan is a high, very high title. So again, so an empire has different nations in it, and each of those nations has a ruler. But if it's an empirical thing, all those pay tribute and give honors to the, the in this case, the sultan that governs over the whole thing. Does that answer your question? That's a lot. Hope you got some more. Right? I want to draw from creation of fallen man. I'm not reading the whole chapter. Right? Um, yeah, that's hard not to read the whole chapter. Okay. But let's start. And where it says, and these soul attributes. Chapter. chapter one, creation of fallen men. Right? There are no verse numbers in this particular chapter. So I'm going to start where it says, and these soul attributes became a, a body beautiful. 
I'm just going to start reading. You'll, you'll catch up on that. It says, and these soul attributes became a body beautiful. A multitude of lessons man must learn upon the plane of the soul. And here he tarries many ages until his lessons are all learned. Upon the boundary of the plane of the soul, the ether began to vibrate slower still, and then the essences took on a final guard. The perfumes and odors and the true sensations and the all of love were clothed in flesh. So those are all the, the situations that you'll be faced with in this plane, right? The perfumes, the odors, and the true sensations, okay? Stop there. Perfumes, the sweet smelling things, things that we love just out here. You know what I'm saying? Beautiful ocean, hear children play, all the beautiful things, right? The perfumes and the odors, you know, like you ever smell something that was a foul smell, completely turns you off? But there's different things that represent that particular energy that's down here too, the things that you can't stand. Having to get up and go to work every morning, you know, arguing, fighting, people killing your people in the streets, all that type of stuff, right? Um, it says, uh, da, 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 da. and the all of love were clothed in flesh. A man was clothed in flesh, and to the end man was clothed in flesh. Perfected man, so that's just, you know, man that was materialized, you know, you know, physical flesh. But perfected man, and we can say perfected woman as well, perfected man must pass through all the ways of life. And so a carnal was full manifest, a nature that sprang forth from fleshy things. Without a foe, a soldier never knows his strength, and thought must be developed by the exercise of strength. And so this nature soon became a foe that man must fight, that he might be the strength of Allah made manifest. Let everything stand still and hear. Man is the Lord of all the plane of manifest, protoplast, mineral, plant, beast, but he gave up his birthrights just to gratify his lower self. Let me stop there. Name some of the things that the ancient Moors have done that were phenomenal. The floor is open. Go ahead. Construction of the Alhambra. Ooh, that's powerful. Those who are not familiar with that, the Alhambra Palace in Granada, Spain, they, they consider it, which that's arguable, but they consider it the finest example of Moorish architecture. Still standing right now. Beautiful. Thank you, brother. This is an open. Universities. Universities. Multiple universities. San Corre, Salamanca, so on and so forth, all over the place, right? University of Fez, right? What else? What else did you, if the word more is messing up your sense of purpose, what did your forefathers create? <laughs> that might help a little. <laughs> I know my people. Agriculture. Also, Agriculture? They actually, Which says everything? Yeah, they perfected um, the water, the, the aqueduct. aqueducts, they perfected those. Which that's interesting because you know they like to say that the Romans, they got that from the Romans, right? Mm. But the, the key thing is with that is that the aqueduct looks like what? And I'm not the artist, our artist is not here today. Yeah, I'm definitely not an artist. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you get it, the arches. The arches, yeah. Right? But the concept about the arch and distrib you know, distributive weight, so on and so forth, that was, that was developed back during the time of ancient Babylon. That's an Asiatic country. Europeans had nothing to do with that, right? They came later and learned it. You know what I'm saying? Well, under Alexander the Great, that whole Macedonian thing, when they went on that conquest, you know, going through Asia, and they started learning, oh, wow, this is whatever, whatever. And then by the time you get up to the Moors, they started, and right before the Moors took power, they started incorporating that, those things in their, in their building. So yes, the aqueducts were basically running water. All right? What else? Mathematics. Say again? Mathematics. Mathematics. Astro Astro Astrology and astronomy, right? With mathematics, the number zero. You know how important the number zero is? Do you know how deep you have to be in your metaphysics to, to understand zero? Why is that? Anybody? Because you have to understand the science of nothingness, the science of the void, the science of a black hole, the science of what they call dark matter, right? You know, they said if they could, you know, in the, in the darkness, it's like when you look at the stars and stuff like that, they said, 98% of what you see as space is composed of what they call dark matter. They say if you were able to take a teaspoon of dark matter and bring it to Earth, it would weigh something like two tons. It's that dense. Islam, right? Um, our forefathers were able to calculate and know that that existed by way of studying the pattern of stars and things like rotations and so on. Right? Something called the astrolabe, okay, which helped them chart the heavens and so on and so forth. So you did all of that. Right? What possibly could have caused you to fall? Mm, come on. 
<laughs> Coming from the sisters, go ahead, y'all. Arrogance and greed, what else we got? Come on now. Complacent. Ooh, that's a good one. Go into that, sister. Why complacency? Why would that cause you to fall? Because you, when you become that person when you just think everything's so easy you mm. turn around and now you let your guards down mm. and you allow and you give too much of yourself and let openness that openness of you know now you're teaching everybody your secrets and stuff instead of giving them just a little bit right. here and there right and now you're giving them everything exactly that goes back to the <laughs> Come on now. Big ego. Yeah, huge ego. <laughs> Planet size ego. <laughs> Look what we built him. Blah, blah, blah. Now we you see the paintings you of your forefather? You see them, bro? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just the. That's all I'm going to say. And see, y'all put that on African now. Mm -hmm. yeah, they, they're Arabic. They don't like that. No, you know, they know who they are. They're they doing some things. And you ain't doing nothing. So that's why they look at you. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> what else? L lower self attributes that might have caused us to fall. Vanity. Mm. Go into that. Go deeper. I mean, I would say just the over overindulging in, in things that really have no no concrete substance mm. in it, you know. Uh, That's fine. Going and, 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 and becoming so enamored with, mm. you know, uh, like I said, things that don't have any substance, specifically um, European female. Mm. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, to the point, even in this damn time, to the point where the term selfie is a word. Yeah. <laughs> like, do you see people, have you seen like people just walking down the street just... Selfie, uh, uh, You see what I'm saying? Just, just enamored with self, right? Not worried about anything, the surroundings, environment, mm -hmm. their connectivity to anything, you know, anything. But then the prophet gives us, you know, this, you know, about the lower self and what it breeds, you know, hatred, slander, lewdness, murder, theft, and everything at arms, right? And these are, the, these are the methods by which we fell, right? And see, the problem is, you know, with dealing with our people is that, you know, when you know what's been done, you know, you have to treat our people when you deal with them as though they're sick. And I know that's, that seems bad, but you can't assume that they're whole until they demonstrate that to you. You got to assume that there may be something wrong with this person, right? Because I know, especially if they don't have their nationality in my creed, right? especially if they identify themselves with slave terms, right? You have to be aware that when you're in environments where you're around people without culture or cultivation, same word, right? Anything could happen, right? So the key is not to, per se, in this damn time, to be so concerned about what Europeans are doing. That's going to, that's going to, they're going to be themselves, right? You have to worry about somebody looking like you flipping out and blowing your head off. That's what you got to worry about, okay? So the whole thing of, you know, being Moorish has to do with, you know, being a, you know, a promoter of civilization, right? So that wherever you go, you're the one in the room. If the whole room is savage, you got to be in the, room, in the room representing all of your noble forefathers. That's Moorish. You understand what I'm saying? It's a, it's a, it's a psyche. You know, it's, it's, all, it's a culture, true, it's a nationality and all that. But it's also it's a psyche. It's a way of, that you process your thoughts. It's a way you process, you know, in other words, like, you know, these people will never meet prophets over Raleigh, they'll meet them for me though, right? So I want them, you know, I want people to magnetize whether I have my vestments on or not, you know, I'm still supposed to be that one in the room. One interesting point, last night when I was at the Grand Lodge, um, when we walked in, it was a European, as soon as we, we walked through the door, since the type of my When we got through the door, the Europeans there, he was like a photographer or something, and he was kind of doing something, and he looked, he saw them with the fans on, he was, how you doing, brother? <laughs> I said, how you doing? He's, I know I should have worn my fast tonight. <laughs> my body. <laughs> I know I should have worn my fast. I said, well, you know, I said, uh, you know you're supposed to wear your fast even though you don't have your fast on. Oh, that's a good way to look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> and your children, boys. You don't want to, you don't want to admit it. I know it. I get it. You know, who wants to, you know, claim the bad kid? I get it. But you got to be the one that, that comes in the room, you know? Bringing your forefathers, bringing that Moorish empire with you by just your walking through the room. Islam? As you said, we were the moral compass of the world. Of the earth. And when we found, and more, you know, specifically amongst us, who it was? Them. Mm -hmm. Our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, our aunties. Our, you see? Because when they saw them roll through the empire, they was like, oh yeah, they ain't playing. Right? If you look at the state that we're in now collectively, 
And I tell you, sisters, that you know, if you want to be, if you want to check how brothers approach you, right? Stand up, be be upright, right? Because a savage don't know how to communicate with that. You know what I'm saying? You know, if he's trying to say something slick or something, you know, something to, you know, to do something that Negroes do, right? If you come, excuse me, don't don't, don't speak to me like that. You'll make him step. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, sister. Huh? You know, much less if you dress like our sisters right here. They don't even know how to begin a sentence talking to them. You know, uh, 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 they, you know, bowing out the way, get awkward around them and all that type of stuff. Which is how it should be. You should be on eggshells around nobility. Islam. But see, this is what our forefathers. This was a part of the curriculum of the studies of the at the universities. That's what the Zenobia demonstrated, right? In there, there was something known as thick. Anyone know the, the Arabic word thick? F I Q H. Write it down. Thick. F I Q H. Thick is a jurisprudence or the science that treats of positive law, right? But you have thick, and then you have something known as adab. Adab, A D A B, is etiquette. Okay? Because you know how, like, you are. You have to teach your children or you know your nephews, wherever the little ones are around you. They're eating some food and they drop it in some dirt to throw it away. But they want to fight you to the nail because they want to eat it. Right? Well, it's the same, you have to do the same thing with our people who are who are adults. You know, we have to teach our people rule of conversation. You know, you're speaking, I'll hush and listen. When you're done, I'll speak. That seems that sounds simple, right? But how often is that rule broken? Which leads to Warfare amongst our people because you cut me off. You know what I'm saying? Shut up and let me talk. I mean, I've, I've heard that so many different times, right? When the, if the simple principle of just rules of conversation was learned, right? Or if you come to someone's house, if Brother Kyle you know, invites me over his house, right? And you know, he unlocks the door, he walks in. I'm not supposed to walk right in behind him. That's not my house. I'm supposed to wait. Islam was all well, all well, because his, his wife's children could be in there just. You know, because they're waiting for him to come home, so they might be in, indisposed, right? So uh, hold on for a second, more. Well, let me let me get them straight first. Islam, you know, this is the ways of your forefathers. We've lost all of that. And see, what happens is when you get in public, you get in a public setting, and you got your fez and your turban on, your crescent pants, you got all the, the vestments of a more. Now they're looking to see if you're demonstrating the cultured more, right? Because there was the more, and then there was the black more. I know that term. Okay, look, write it down. Black hyphen A hyphen more. Black or more, right, was the period of time when the Moors had gotten conquered, right? It was a quick term that they started using before they put, they labeled them Morisco, okay, or little more. Morisco in Spanish is little more, right? Meaning that uh, that was a, a way of calling you a minor, you know, one not responsible for it. You know, knowing government and so on and so forth. But uh, the Blackamoor, um, yes, they can label Moors, but they had been broken, right? So you had generations of them that didn't know, you know what I'm saying, what their forefathers had done, so on and so forth, right? Though they were still in the same lands to be able to see. You know, there would be a whole psychological thing if you were able to walk down Cleveland Avenue and look and see that Alhambra Palace right there. You know, that would do something to your genetic code to let you know I got a connection to that, right? One of the main things that the Europeans did when they came here was knock down a lot of. Stuff. So, Y'all heard of the Smithsonian Institute? Mm -hmm. yeah. The Smithsonian Institute is one of the hallmark institutions that hide Aboriginal and Indigenous artifacts in the Americas. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, there's a newspaper, it's called the Arizona Gazette. Write this down 1906 Arizona Gazette. Um, there was an article where it was a man, he was in the, the Grand Canyon, and he was in a canoe, he was going down, and um, you know, his arms got tired or whatever, so he, you know, you know, what if, you know, and, you know, uh, moored it, you know, tied to the side or whatever, put it up to the side, of, you know, on the dirt or whatever, and, you know, walked up in one of the caverns, you know, in there. And when he got in there, what he saw blew his mind because cut into the walls were statues of Buddha, Osiris, um, Ra, like all the, all these ancient statues that we consider to be over in the East or right in Arizona, right? I think it was a section called Four Corners, Arizona, something, whatever. But and if you research that Arizona Gazette newspaper article, it'll come up. But the point is, the Smithsonian Institute went in there after that, and 
and chisel all that stuff out and put it in the basement and hit it and all that type of stuff, whatever, right? But the point is this armor had gotten out before the Smithsonian got there, right? And they covered it, right? But, um, you know, and again, like I've, I've, you know, I've always shared with y'all, the new uh, the magazine, uh, Ancient American Magazine, some must. Like, if you're serious about knowing what took place here before the European got here, you know, research that. I mean, you want to research, like, you know, Israelite artifacts that were found, like, in Michigan and Illinois and so on and so forth. Muslim artifacts. Um, ancient ancient stuff, like, down in, like, uh, I think it was Venezuela, they found a tablet that had a crucifixion with 12 disciples on it when dating, like, 4,000 years ago, before the so-called Jesus of 2,000 years ago, but in Venezuela. Islam, so research that ancient American magazine. Now, all they do is archaeological digs from Canada all the way down to Argentina. Okay? So again, like, you know, there's so much that's being unearthed and unveiled concerning the Prophet Noble Jurali brought us back in those days. And I know my people, because the sad part is we can take it from Europe, we can accept it from Europeans. You know, we can accept it from, you know, so-called scholars and academic people, and, you know, they have the alphabets behind their names. But one come from amongst you, blessed by Allah to know and tell you you can't accept it from them. And I tell you, you know, as sure as my name is Heru, that if we don't get out of that, we're gonna be slaves again. I guarantee you that, you know, with your fez and turban on and all that, with your L and Bay and all that type of stuff, right? You think when chattel slavery went down, it wasn't some Moors that was caught up in that? I mean, you know, you had some Sub-Saharan tribe that got caught up, right? But then there was some, how many times have you heard, like, princes of Morocco got caught up in the slave trade and had to declare, yo, I'm, you know what I'm saying? I'm royalty, I'm not, I'm not that. You see what I'm saying? You know? So, but when they put him in the cages or tied him side by side, it didn't make a difference if he had a fez on, if he just had a, a woolly afro next to him and a loincloth. It didn't matter. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know what I mean? When they come, when that, when that wave of barbarity comes through, it doesn't make a distinction. If you're not with them, you're against them. Okay? Well, moving forward, it says, um, but man will regain his lost estate, his heritage, but he must do it in a conflict that cannot be told in words. Let me pause there. World Wars one and two. You can look at the carnage and you can describe it. You can use words to describe it, right? What is the what is a conflict that cannot be told in words look like? Mm, like the state of man, state of internal conflict, internal conflict, internal conflict, internal conflict, internal Come on. Come on, sister. Say it. Internal conflict. You have an internal conflict, right? Because sometimes when you're going through, when you're going through your personal, anybody know the word jihad? What does that word mean? You say holy war, right? But the word jihad, literally, what's, what's the real jihad? The essence of that word. It's the fight between your higher and lower self. It's an internal struggle. It's not like, you know, you yell a loud whack bar and go cut somebody's head off. That's not what that is, right? It's, we all wage our personal jihad daily, right? And when you're going through that, somebody asks you what's wrong, how often times are you able to explain what's going on with you? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, just I, ask me later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's one, that's one demonstration of it. Or there's something that can take place that's so vile and so... Traumatic? Yeah, I guess. Like I'm trying, to, I'm trying to find an English word that, you know, but there's destructions that can take place that if you saw that, there's no word there to explain that. Like, people speak what we call foreign languages. Like, if you take a native Arabic speaker and you're trying to get them, or you know, they say a word, you say, what does that mean? Uh, uh. You see this, they get to doing the dance, you know, uh, well, that kind of means that. Because there's only semblance. There are no exact translations. Why we say Allah, the Father of the universe. Because you can't bring, like, there's some, there's some that say, They'll, they, they, they don't like the word Allah. So there's certain ones, they'll say, our God, Father of the universe. And that's like, you know, remember the old chalkboards? And, <laughs> to me, that my, my sensibilities, it throws it, because I know that's not a good translation of the word Allah, right? Because what, am I, what are you saying when you're saying the term Allah? When you're saying Allah, you're saying, and this is, this is a generality, I'm, I'm attempting it. The totality of all created and uncreated things. Does, does that make any sense to you? Mm. So, you know, you take all of creation, right, all of the seen, right, and all of the unseen, you know, so you have three realms, the known, the unknown, and the unknowable, right? 
So the known clearly, you know, the things that you can see with your first eyes and so, so forth. The unknown, right, which are things that, you know, you can go in meditation, right, and you can go in higher realms and kind of bring certain things back, right? So it's unknown to the uninitiated, but if you're initiated into, into those degrees of how to bring that back, then you can bring that stuff back, right? And then there's certain things that you can only know once you leave this. You know what I'm saying? Because this is, you know, it's a prison house. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Your higher self is supposed to be a warden, but a lot of times it's your lowest, unfortunately. But, um, you know, so this is the whole thing. So, you know, there, there will be carnage that takes place on this planet where when people look at it, like ancient battlefields, like when you look at ancient battlefields, man, like, you know, where it was just like arms and legs, heads all over the place and, you know, humanity was trying to work towards getting away from that level of conflict. You see what I'm saying? The European had even gotten tired of that to a certain level why they start coming up with the Geneva, the Geneva Convention, right? Where they you know, sought to put in place rules of war as though that, that could really exist, right? But, you know, okay, well, yeah, if you take a prisoner, you have to feed him, right? Well, what was the first time you, you had a Geneva Convention? Where did the European get that concept from? Anybody know? Anybody read the Quran of Mecca before? What kind of the cover? <laughs> if we go to battle, read Surah to Tawbah, the ninth surah. Suratul Tauba, which is because it's a chapter that deals with warfare, it's the only chapter in the Quran of Mecca, the 114 surahs and chapters, that does not start, Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, it does not start in the name of Allah, the merciful net, because it's talking about warfare and a bunch of things, and rules of engagement, basically. And then it goes into, like, if you go into, like, in other words, it gives you the degree. Um, are Muslims ever allowed to be the aggressor? No. Why not? Because at the point that you become the aggressor, you have become what you're fighting off. Islam? And how often, like, you know, during the war, Islamically I'm speaking, during the war, how often, how long are you supposed to fight them? Somebody attacks us. Allah forbid. Somebody attacks us. And we, we go to we engage, right? At what point are we supposed to stand down? When they submit. When they submit. Islam? Or if they retreat. And technically, in the ancient world, amongst the greatest of our forefathers, they said, leave them some dignity, give them an out. That's what your forefathers were. So give them an out? Give them an out. Oh, an out. You okay. see what I'm saying? Because when you, when you, um, when you denigrate a man, you know, when you, yeah. they don't feel good. You know, when you, if I grab you and torture you and all that, and you happen to get away, you're going to spend your every waking hour coming to get us back. You see what I'm saying? But let's say we, during the time that we had you, there was a lot of people that the, the ancient Muslims, when they went to war with them, you know, as they had them captive, when they saw how the Muslims demonstrated the civilization, a lot of them ended up taking Shahada and becoming Muslims. You see, because it was a, a degree of civility that was being demonstrated that did not exist where they were from. You see, and that's our forefathers. So this is where the European is getting much of his international law. Do a Google search on, type in Quran, and international law. And you'll begin to see where they got a lot of this stuff. <clears throat> see, so they claim to hate Islam and all yeah. that type of stuff. Like I just told you, the European told me he wished he wore his fez last night. So he got a fez, he got the degrees of Islam or an outer shell of it. And the outer shell is, you know, is enough to get him the, the certain degrees of cultivation of it. All right? <laughs> Here's another thing I thought of. You know how barbaric, you know, the European, you know, presents himself to be? Imagine if he didn't have the Bible. You ever thought about that? If he didn't have your forefathers' text of morality, what do you think he would be? If you think he's bad now. And why do you think our forefathers were the ones that gave him that text? Why did you think we allowed, we allowed them to serve us? Right? Because, you know, when they were, you know, as our servants, if the call to prayer went off the alarm, you think we just prayed and they didn't? They prayed with us. Anybody ever heard of the uh, Mamluks? The Mamluks? No? Right? The Mamluks were a group of slaves, European slaves in Egypt, right? That eventually overthrew the Asiatic presence in Egypt and became a ruling power at a certain point. The marine uniform, 
The sword that they carry is called the Mamluk sword. They demonstrate that degree. Islam, all right? And, um, and again, you know, in the Marine uh, Anthem, they say what? From the halls of Matazuma to the shores of Tripoli. Where is that at? On the map, where is that at? From the halls of Matazuma. Matazuma was a sultan ruling where? Mexico. Mm -hmm. To the shores of Tripoli. Where's Tripoli? Tripoli is in the eastern coast. Libya. Libya. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. That's where the Marines were fighting to overthrow the Moorish presence. So even in that anthem, they're telling you that they overthrew you from the Americas way over to Africa. Islam? Mm -hmm. And the word Marine. Mm -hmm. And the word Marine. Is Ma, which is more. Because marine means what? Water. Water. And the Moors were what? The navigators of the seven seas that controlled the waters. Right? Yeah. Research um, Thomas Jefferson who says uh, one million for defense, but one not one cent for tribute. What does that what does that, that phrase mean? One million for defense, but not one cent for trade. Anybody? In your research, type in or type in in your Google search the Barbary Wars. B A R B A R Y Wars, right? And this was when your forefathers were robbing European ships who were sailing in waters that they didn't have permission to sail. When they came through, we boarded this ship took the crew hostage, right? Sent a couple people back to their people and said, look, we need to sit down and negotiate because you violated our, you know, our, our international, the laws of the international maritime laws, okay? So what happened was the European nations, the 13 colonies, found themselves in the position of paying tribute or taxes to the Sultan of Morocco. There's a letter that circulated, um, if you give me uh, either today or by tomorrow, I'll put it in the study group on Facebook. Um, there's a letter that's circulating of George Washington apologizing to the Sultan of Morocco for being late on his taxes. Islam? So from George Washington to Thomas Jefferson, they were paying, you know, continual tax payments because who was the first nation to recognize the 13 colonies as a Morocco. 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 Yes, sir. Is this in, I guess, uh, correlation to the uh, Treaty of Peace and Friendship? That's Absolutely. Okay. Now, have you ever read it? Yeah. Okay, now what is what the Treaty of Peace Friendship is dealing with? What primarily? Maritime law and and the ability to do trade and commerce and trade. Okay. Exactly. So that's the thing they deal with. See again, right? You know, we, we do a lot of building and discussing. Them. It all boils down to finance, man. That's what runs the world. You see what I'm saying? And it's like, you know, as you know, as we open up talking about the Canaanites and trade and this and that, trans trade, all that, and it comes right back around to commerce and trade. Right? So, and there was a bunch of treaties struck between 1787, you know, you know somewhere at 1786, actually, right? And then, you know, exactly, right? And then, um, you know, it was uh, 50 years later, well, actually, 1786, they agreed that 50 years later, because 50 years is based on what? In the Isla uh, in Israelite law, the 50 year period. No, I don't know. Torah, the Jubilee period. Okay. Right? So, again, so why are the Moors? Demonstrated the degree of the 50 year or the Jubilee period, unless the Moors had the concept of Torah law as well. Yes. So connect. The six point of star, we're one. Stop playing it. So, 1786, 50 year Jubilee period, they agreed. So, we're going to try this treaty. And if it works, you know, 50 years, 50 years after that, we'll come back and we'll, we'll redo it and it'll be perpetual from that point on. So, from 50 years from 1786, is uh, 1836, which is the Treaty of America. So the one that you want to quote is not the Treaty of Peace of Friendship. That's not the one that's enforced. The one that's enforced, enforced being still standing, right? The one that's enforced is the Treaty of Marrakesh, which is 1836. Islam, that's the one that all U.S. presidents get up and give honor when they when they do when they uh, visit Morocco. You know, we honor that. You know, we honor the first. Um, you know, the first nation to ever recognize. The United States of America as an independent nation was Morocco. Barack Obama went a little far with that speech. Yeah. 
Because I don't know if y'all remember that speech, because he got, went to talk about the Islamic achievements and the more, he said everything except more. He kept saying the Islamic empire. Praise Allah, we know what you're saying, right? But the point is, is that uh, most U.S. presidents get up and just bear witness to the treaty and have the flag up, so on and so forth. But, um, but it dealt with commerce and trade, commerce and trade. Um, we have a uh, 1791, you might want to write it down. Here, write this down, as a matter of fact. The Avalon Project, and the Avalon Project is by Yale University. And the Avalon Project, any legal document that's ever been struck here in the United States, with the United States and other countries, they have it on there. So you can go to Avalon Project and in that search engine type in the 1791 treaty between the U.S. and Tripoli, right? You know how you like to say America is a Christian nation? Well, in that treaty, they agreed that in no way, shape, or form shall America ever be a Christian nation. They were under treaty as agreeing to that. 1791? 1791 treaty between Tripoli and the United States. See, see, we don't know ourselves. We can't enforce nothing. That's long. If we want to be everything else except, you know what I mean? We got to go with what those laws said we were. I mean, now if we want to go custom wise and call ourselves different things, through custom, that's another thing. But through, for, through law and what's enforceable, that's specific. You know, and in legal constructs, you know, all law is specific. You can't be ambiguous. Islam? All right? Um, let me continue. I uh, just want to close this out real quick. It says um, Man will be fully saved, redeemed, perfected by the things he suffers on the plane of flesh and on the plane of soul. When man has conquered carnal things, his garb of flesh will then have served its purpose well and will fall, will be no more. Then he will stand untrammeled on the plane of soul where he must complete, full complete his victories. Unnumbered foes will stand before man upon the plane of soul. These he must overcome, yea, overcome them every one. Thus hope will ever be his beacon light. There is no failure for the human soul for Allah is leading on, and victory is sure. Man cannot die. The spirit man is one with Allah. And while Allah lives, man cannot die. When man has conquered, conquered every foe upon the plane of soul, the seed will have full opened out, will have unfolded in the holy breath. The garb of soul will then have served its purpose well, and man will need it never more, and it will pass and be no more, and man will then attain unto blessedness of perfectness, perfectness and be at one with Allah. Islam, Lord, mm -hmm. Islam. surely Allah speaks the truth to his holy prophet, but we draw Ali. Islam? Islam, now, you know, that's, that's another thing too, because <clears throat> the individualism has to stop. We have to, we, we have to get our group mind back again. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know, um, I'm a Star Wars buff. I love Star Wars, I always, lo always love Star Wars. And in fact, in December, <laughs> I'm gonna have my ticket I might be in line waiting midnight to get, you know, I, the last Jedi as a Muslim. We saw the preview. Did I just plug the book? Anyway. We saw the I don't think I should have done that. I'm not getting paid for that. But, um, but, <laughs> see, that's what you get for being on your head over heels about something. Uh, but there was a scene in there because, again, if, you know, Europeans put your sciences in, in your face, mm -hmm. we don't know. First of all, research this too. Research this European, his name is Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell was a, is what they call a mythologist. So he goes around the planet studying Asiatic and European, but mainly Asiatic um, systems of myths, right? And he was George Lucas's mentor, right? So he was the one that helped him draft the script because George Lucas said, "I want to draft a script that no matter where it's seen on the planet, the themes that are portrayed within will speak to all nations." So he wanted to demonstrate the universal truth. In there, there was a particular scene amongst many um, where it was, um, it was like a planet or something that blown up. And Yoda was like, you know, it's the disturbance and the force. You know, being tied into that collective mind state. And I'm not going to get into breaking the movie down. Me and Brother Saul, <laughs> you don't want to get us started with that. Right? <clears throat> but, you know, that whole, you know, they demonstrate the concept of the collective mind. You know what I mean? There's a psychic field that we've separated ourselves from that we need to tie that into because that's how you perceive danger. You know what I mean? Which I don't have to tell the Salah Hadin family because they know that when you're out in those woods, mm -hmm. that there's a, there's a set of psyche or psychic awareness that comes online that you don't have to use out here. You know? 
and it has to come online because your subconscious self is saying, we're in an environment where anything could go down. Islam, right? So your, your God senses start coming, you know, coming aware. And there's some people that fight that process and can't, they can't take it. They have a psychological breakdown because they, they don't want to access that level of divinity, right? Because their, their carnal self is at war with the divine. Islam, all right? So without, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, the temples are designed to do is to get us back into that oneness, right? That when something happens to one of us, we all feel it. You know what I'm saying? You ever get that feeling like, okay, I ain't heard from this system in a long time, man. Reach out for her. And you reach out and you find out something wrong with that system. You know what I'm saying? But she couldn't tell you because she was, you know, she was going through, she was solving, you know, solving her, you know, her issues or whatever, right? But we got to get to, or just to, or just the point where some of us are too proud to tell each other what we're going through. You know what I mean? So we got to get that psychic feel back, but we can only get it by being around each other. You know what I'm saying? You know, you only develop, like, example, like, in, you know, in the military, they do like close quarter drill, right? But in combat, you're not going to use close quarter drill. So what is close quarter drill used for? It's used to create that one mind. So when you're in the field, you can remember remember the relation that binds you to love and unity. Islam, all right. That if something happened to one, you're not going to leave him on the battlefield and just keep going. You know, we if we all came in together. We all going to leave together. Islam. Right, or you know, we look around at our brothers and sisters, you know what I'm saying? You know, we should want for our brother, we want for ourselves. You know what I'm saying? So we got a brother, you know what I'm saying? You know, they got some run over shoes, but you got good shoes. We should, brother, what size you wear? You know, we should, we, we, you know, we want to do something for you, brother, don't worry, don't worry about that. What size you wear? You, you see what I'm saying? Getting back to that level of love and looking out for one another. Islam? That's more. That's what people of culture do. When was the last time you seen a homeless Chinese person? I'm gonna ask, I'm, you know, I'm gonna ask the South Highlands because they be in the field. <laughs> so when y'all be in the field, what's the last time you seen a homeless Indian, East Indian, East Indian. not Indian? Mm -hmm. Respectfully, that was that was that was that was Thank you, brother. That's fine. It's all Uh But yes. No. No. Asian, maybe. Perhaps. Like, on purpose. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. 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 Not like. Not a lot. Mm -mm. Okay. Why? Why do you think that? They're not gonna let it happen. You're not gonna make us look like that. They'll send you back. Yeah, you're going. You're going back home. You're, you're getting the one way. Home. You're getting the one way ticket back home. <laughs> they literally will send you back. As long, you know what I'm saying? You know, so we, you know, we have to get to that degree. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not using homeless as a target for whatever. I'm just saying that the fact that, you know, whatever we're going through, you know, we have to have the ability. Like the prophet gave us the instruction. He said, you know, there'll be a time come when mercy will be left up to those who have no mercy in them. You know what I mean? So this is the day and time that we have. People don't feel what you're going through. You know what I mean? So you have to establish your own body politic. You know what I mean? Where you take care of those things yourself. Islam, one of us loses a job, we all get on a hunt to find that person a job. Or create a job. I'm a fan of that. Create the job so the person don't have to. You know what I mean? You know, because the prophet gives us that thing about the beggar nation. You know, the beggar nation cannot attain the heights of spirituality. Islam, you know, it's hard to you know, practice your yoga when you're in this Yes, sister. You were talking about you, really, right. you, were talking about you really see homeless Indian mm -hmm. Asians, but in India. There's oh, that's I didn't. That's a whole other thing. But that's structurally though, see, because in India, what they, what's causing it in India? Do you know? You ever heard of the Brahmin caste system? Mm -hmm. yeah. What is it? Where it's the, the dark, I know the darkest mm -hmm. people are considered at the bottom. The untouchables are the coolies, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the lighter skin ones are considered, right? Um, and then there's the thing, you know, the extreme versions of karma, the teachings that they have, the point where, let's say, because, you know, again, just let's square homelessness in India. Like, here in America, you might have a person that, you know, a bad set of circumstances hit them. You know what I'm saying? They found themselves, but growing up, they might have grew up in a whole world. In India, it's not like that. In, in India, you might have 10 generations of homes. They've never lived in a house. They've always lived outside. You got stuff like that. What happens is, they'll have a teacher that says, karmically, they inherited that. So if I help him, I'm getting involved in his karma, which means action. So they stay away from it and let them, you see what I'm saying? You know? Um, clearly, in our sensibilities, that's wild, right? But that's their way over there. But when they come here, right, it's a whole nother thing after that because 
every, every free national group has an organization like the More Science Temple of America that teaches them how to function under a republic, right? Teach them how to function on these shores under this. You see what I'm saying? So they have an Indian version of that. They have a Jewish version of that, Mexican version, so on and so forth. So they teach them, like, look, ain't nobody, in other words, you ever heard like an Indian, you ever heard of a sadhu or a guru? You ever heard of a guru before, all right? These are these mystics, so on and so forth, that you know, renounce the world and just, you know, their aesthetics, they live, you know, out of nature. But you'll find a situation where, like, the community will come and offer them food, leave food, offerings, give them a bowl of food, stuff like that because that's ingrained in the culture to take care of the sadhu, who basically becomes some level of a priest, okay? But the community takes care of it. Here, you can become a sadhu all you want. Ain't nobody gonna offer you no bowls of food as an offer. You know what I'm saying? So they realize that, so they have to augment what they're used to doing to live here, while you don't see homeless Indians, right? Because they have a system in place with checks and balances to make sure they don't end up like that, right? Because there's no one to sympathize or be empathetic to what they're going. You understand what I'm saying? So that's why, like you said, in India, that's why they exist there. Okay. Anyone else? Have any other questions? All right, now don't catch me after me. <laughs> Hit the door. <laughs> Up the street. Any other questions, comments, concerns, or statements? All is well? Wow, um, y'all are nice. Praise the Lord. And with that, I'll lower the meeting. Us? Okay. Well, we have announcements. Okay, come on. Let's, let's do the other. What do you have? Um, oh, sorry. All right, Stephen Humphrey, Salala, Estenos Harris. Estenos Harris is probably nobody really. Islam, sir. So, 1111, which is Saturday, next yes. week, Saturday, we are doing Feed the Homeless instead of the third Saturday. We're doing it next Saturday. Okay. We're also doing it in conjunction with Mas 15. 15B. Right, so as far as I know, they. They've already announced it at their temple. Right. That's what I was told already. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll Excuse continue. me, who are you going to communicate with? Um, Brother Gerald? Brother Gerald and Sister Nana. Sister Nana. So we've been talking uh, right. with them. So um, yeah, it'll be her part as normal, mm -hmm. 8 o'clock in the morning, about an hour. Um, I know they're bringing some stuff. She's supposed to be getting me some stuff already. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll put it in the message group and the Trillo, so you guys kind of keep an eye on that. Work. Um, also, we've been reminded that uh, election is coming up. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody who is November, like, 7th. November 7th, if you are registered in Atlanta, mm -hmm. you are to go ahead and vote. Um, they're saying um, it's in Fort as a temple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that a lot. Um, so Could you hand me those? Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, I'll let you, I'll let you and continue. I'm thinking, was there anything else that we were supposed to speak I think that was it. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Praise the yeah. Lord. Thank you, sister. Um, Sheikh Rashid, our brother chairman, our beloved brother chairman, um, he left me um, some little flyers here. And it's a group. And they're going by the name BlackSleepATL.org. And. Um, it's basically a list of candidates that they're that they're getting behind. It says, it says, vote the black slate, elect candidates pledged to confront the problems of the Atlanta metropolitan community, Board of Commission District 4, uh, Catherine Flowers, that's what they're getting behind, Atlanta School Board District 1, Ade Oguntoye, um, City of Atlanta Mayor Vincent Ford, they're also doing him, uh, Atlanta City Council President C.T. Martin, Atlanta City Council President at Large, Post 1, Michael Julian Bond, so on and so forth, so, you know, so as to not kill time. Um, we have copies here, so we'll just give these out. And you can just, over this weekend, like, you know, research each one of them to see who you want to get behind. Because again, you know, in Islam, there's no compulsion in religion, so we can't compel you, you know, to vote a particular way. But we, you know, we do, as Moorish American Muslims, we do suggest that you vote Islam, because as a citizen, it is your divine right to do so, right? And, uh, and again, like the elders always say, you don't have a right to complain. <laughs> if you don't take a part, take part in the process. So we'll make these available. Islam? Islam. Islam Moors? Islam. Moors Science Temple of America. Noble Drew Ali, a founder, home office, Chicago, Illinois. March 11th, 1929, a warning from the prophet to be read in every meeting. I hereby inform all members that they must put an end to all radical and agitating speech while on their jobs, homes, or on the public streets. We advocate peace and not destruction. Stop trying out your cards with the Europeans, for it causes confusion. 
There has been much confusion caused by members trying out their cards. The cards are for your salvation. Failure of obeying my orders will be of severe consequence. We are for love, truth, peace, freedom, and when these principles are violated, the justice must then take its course. Any member or group of members that seek to hold malicious feelings towards the temple or the prophet or to violate the divine covenant of the Moorish movement will receive their reward from Allah for their unjust deeds. All true Moors must obey the laws laid down to them by their prophet, and if they lose confidence in their prophet, give up your card and button, cease wearing your turban or feds, and return to the state where I, the prophet, found you. For this is a holy and divine movement founded by the prophet, Noble Jurali. And if the prophet is not right, the temple is not right. The prophet is sending out a divine plea to all true Moorish Americans that they may do their part to protect the prophet and the temple. This is an everlasting movement founded by the prophet through the will of Allah to redeem his people from their sinful ways. Peace. Noble Jurali Islam. 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 All praise is due to Allah, the highest of honors, to his holy and divine prophet, prophet over Dr. Islam, boys. Islam. Um, I'd like to put something down real quick. Um, MSTA 19 Treasury at gmail.com through PayPal. Any ones want to make donations to Temple Number 19 to help us in our great uplifting work, feel free to send it through PayPal that way. Okay? You can you know, you bring it to the temple, or if you're on digital currency, whatever you're doing, you can send it through PayPal because it takes finance to uplift the nation. Islam, all right? Um, that's something that, you know, in simple number 19, we do a lot of a lot of teaching, a lot of educating, but we don't harp much on the financial aspect. And again, this is a, the way the Prophet set this up, this is what is referred to a not-for-profit organization, which means that we fuel ourselves by philanthropic acts of people, or donations from people, free will offerings from people. Islam? So if the Prophet Noble Drali has done something for you, you got his fez on your head, you got the turban, the crescent pen, or even if you haven't proclaimed your nationality yet and you want to assist the Prophet in his great uplifting acts, please feel free to donate to Temple Number 19. As you know, we, we publish books. We do all types of stuff to help people, educate them, to win our people back so they can be themselves and no one else. Islam? Islam. And with that said, we will go ahead and close the meeting with prayer. Everyone, please rise. Face the east, which is right, right ahead of you. Hold your feet at a 45 degree angle, standing in the square. Heels will be touching like this. There's five on the left, two on the right. Invoking the sacred presence of the seven Elohim that created everything that ever was, is, or evermore shall be. Please repeat after me. Allah. Allah. Father of the universe. Father of the universe. The Father of love. The Father of love. Truth. Truth. Peace. Peace. Freedom. Freedom. And justice. And justice. Allah is my protector. Allah is my protector. My guide. My guide. And my salvation. And my salvation. By night. By night. And by day. And by day. Through His holy prophet. Through His holy prophet. Through Ali. Through Ali. Amen. Amen. Islam, boys. Islam. Peace, love.